Hello everyone and welcome back to my attempt to construct the International Space Station in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3 and we pick up where we left off with STS-92 docked to the space station and here bringing out the Z1 truss and trying to attach it to the station. Now this Z1 truss is from CX Aerospace and not from the original ISS community pack because the one from the ISS community pack had a collider issue and we couldn't attach things to it properly so I decided to go with this one and it sort of looks a little bit more proper anyway but it's still a trick to try and attach it properly to the station rotational wise and orienting it properly but this is comparatively simpler than the next part which is PMA3 because of the place that the shell is at the position it's at is a little bit awkward to attach that one so this one was a little bit more straightforward you can see a little bit of a wobble there. I did tune down the speed at which the um, canad arm parts move and the acceleration, but still there's a little bit of a wobble. There'd be a lot more wobble if not for that. Uh, the Z1 truss has reaction wheels, not well, gy uh, gyroscopic stabilizers or whatever they're called, not technically reaction wheels, but functionally the same idea. And it's also very heavy, it's like 9 tons. So, yeah. Uh, it could actually, with every movement, it sort of moves the station because it's a significant mass. But we got it on, and there it is, hopefully in a suitable orientation. The next mission will carry up uh, the P6 truss with solar arrays, and that's actually attached to this on that small docking port, that propellant-only docking port. So I had to make sure that we had that. That was one of the stumbling blocks of the previous attempt to build this station where we didn't actually have that docking port initially and that was a problem. I had forgotten that uh, the Z1 truss needed that to attach this P6 truss to it. Anyway, here we deploy that antenna and everything is set as far as that's concerned. Uh, but now we have to move on to the PMA3, Pressurized Mating Adapter 3. We've got two of them on Unity right now. One of them is the one that the shuttle is docked to, the other side is where Zarya is. And the thing about getting this out is, first of all, it's part of the ISS community pack, so it's colliders iffy. Second of all, um, it's not very easy to block it with the cannon arm where it is right now, and so it wants to drift away. I just don't know where I can attach to it because the collider is not obvious. And you can sort of see me trying to search for the right point with canned arm, having a bit of a problem. Ultimately, I think I actually attached to the docking port rather than the PMA part itself, because at least the collider is there. Anyway, uh, there we go. Yeah, we we do have it. I think it's by the docking port. Now the trouble here is we have to get this. PMA-3 on the opposite side of the station from the Z-1 truss, and the arm just doesn't really bend that way. So I sort of had to pick between making this easy to attach the Z-1 truss. I guess we should have probably had the shuttle turned 90 degrees to make it easier to get both of them on. I don't, I don't recall whether I had a picture of how the shuttle was oriented with respect to the station while doing this. It's been a while since I recorded this part. Uh, the next part of the video, after this mission completes, uh, is more recent. But this was more than a month ago, so I don't remember I was, if I was working off of a picture of where the shuttle was. Anyway, first of all, I decided to attach the PMA-3 to that adapter, that docking port, and then uh, move it off from there. But grabbing it again after putting it there was sort of a little bit difficult, as you can see right here. It's drifting off and it's not really attached to the arm and I uh, well it, for a sec there I thought that I had it but actually I didn't so it drifted off and I'll try to make sure you know when I reverted or needed to redo stuff and that was one of those times so I did um, quick load and I decided that we would have to reorient the shuttle so here I am uh, turning the shuttle. The PMA-3 is attached to that uh, incorrect docking port right now. And then re-docking the shuttle. 
And the trouble with this is, of course, doing this means that we don't have as much fuel to return home. And my hope was never to have to do the whole shuttle refueling thing in this uh, second attempt to assemble the ISS. In the first attempt, we really very often had to send up refuelers for the shuttle, and that was very inconvenient and, of course, incorrect. Uh, the key to avoiding that is A, making sure that the shuttle gets into exactly the right inclination for the ISS, which is not so much a matter of the inclination as a timing, the longitude of ascending node thing. Uh, and that's a little bit tricky. That's not due to the launch script, that's due to me uh, picking the launch window, you know, timing it. Uh, the second thing is, of course, not, you know, taking so long to dock, and also not having to redock because that takes a lot of RCS fuel. Anyway, we grabbed a hold of PMA3 there, and here we can much more easily move it to the right docking port. I'm not too sure whether um, the, the sloped side of PMA3, I guess you could call it, is uh, on the Russian side or pointing towards the American side or... but presumably I was looking at a picture while doing this though just the fact that we were placed the way we were limited how I could actually place the PMA3 so if this is incorrect forgive me but but if possible I was trying to get it right and if I didn't get it right, it was probably because I couldn't figure out how to move Canadarm in a way to get it exactly the way the picture had it. Um, I feel often like I need another joint in Canadarm that rotates, uh, rolls, does roll. We've only got one roll axis and that's at the end effector. I could really use a roll axis pretty much anywhere else, but there's no part that does that. Anyway, job done for STS-92. Uh, this is the Shuttle Discovery. Headed home now. We have less than the 400 meters per second that I would normally want to uh, deorbit with in order to make sure we can hold our orientation through the atmosphere coming back down. And that's particularly problematic because we sort of have to go into a standby orbit so I can calculate things it's very hard to make sure that we're going to actually hit Cape Canaveral on any particular orbit if we're not if I can't calculate exactly which orbit we're gonna get it at um, if you watch the live streams this is all done during live stream of course if you watch live streams I can make it much more clear uh, because I can show you the map and exactly what I'm doing but it's very easy to be off let me put it that way and of course for most of the re-entry we are using the re-entry program to decide how to orient the shuttle and it varies between 38 and 45 degrees depending on the distance and where it's at uh, in terms of altitude. It's based on altitude and distance. So uh, here we are coming back down but we are rapidly running out of RCS fuel. The program has to use the RCS fuel in order to uh, handle the orientation and it's basically close to maxing out pitch right now. Of course in the lower atmosphere the aerodynamic surfaces help. Um, the shuttle itself really would have a very particular center of mass position to make sure it could maintain its orientation properly and it wouldn't use so much RCS. And at this point trying to actually get to Cape Canaveral I decided to take manual control way earlier than I should. Uh, even in an emergency, I would not like to take it before 45 kilometers. Uh, but I figured I had to take it right there if we wanted any chance to get back to Cape Canaveral. So I could do more drastic maneuvers than the program was prepared to do. The program does try to turn towards the Cape and use the wings to get to the right heading. But um, it, it's within tighter bounds. Anyway, uh, as I was saying... The whole idea of getting the center mass right is something I need to work on. It's tough to figure out because we can't really shift it with this. It's got all the fuel in the back. There's not much room in front to like move the center mass forward or not much in front that we can send to the back. So maybe I could like put some test tanks in. You know, uh, stuff that like av gas or something to pump forward and back to shift it around to see. Anyway, uh, here I am lining up of the runway. We did make it. 
uh, thanks to you know extraordinary extraordinary lift with this vehicle I assume far is getting it right I mean it does ray tracing and bounces off of the vehicle to figure out the aerodynamics of it so I I can't really tell I haven't really figured out how to configure wing surfaces or anything like that for far so uh, it's a total mystery to me how this aspect of the aerodynamics works and you know configuring the part for aerodynamics that's something I haven't done before so I'm assuming it's getting it right hoping but uh, yeah anyway the important thing is we could get back home and I genuinely want to do that legitimately as much as possible Ah, I uh, continue to fail to tune down these darn drag chutes. They're way too powerful. I know it's only supposed to have one, but there's a problem with that in that where I can put them on the tail, um, it, it doesn't want to be right at the center, so I need two to make sure it's balanced. No, that's just a complication. Anyway, this is STS-92 complete, and we move on to STS-97. And this is Endeavor. I'm just gonna say right out that this particular attempt is going to have to be reverted. And the critical reason why is because the canned arm I had was not long enough to put this part on the Z1 truss. Now, there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, one, the way we actually grip parts with the canned arm right now. Uh, two, the, the size, the thickness of the docking ports the common berthing mechanisms is a little bit too thick and I should have probably shifted them into the parts a little bit more which would have helped. Anyway we'll see some of that but full disclosure we did make this attempt and you know uh, to some extent it's instructive and still looks good. So here we go the little roll with the shuttle as we get the external tank facing the ground Incidentally, these solar truss segments were the heaviest parts that the shuttle brought to the station. They come in at about 15.9 tons, and each of them is basically identical on, well, not exactly. The P6 truss uh, with its solar rays is 15.8, and then it's sort of tied with the P3, P4, and the S3, S4, and yeah. And the S6 as well. The PE1 and S1 trusses are lighter. They're at 14 tons. But yeah, the fuel margins are really tight on this. And we didn't do a particularly good job on the whole inclination thing coming up. So that's going to hurt us. But here we are docking. And I did have a picture. This I just did recently this past weekend. And I did go by the picture for where the shuttle docked. And it did dock on... PM83, which is on the opposite side of the Z1 truss, of course, we just added it. And that's interesting because we have to get this truss onto the Z1 truss. Now initially, because of its position in the bay, I gripped it from the middle, and that's because that's as far back on it that I could grip it based on its position in the bay. If it was forward in the bay, I could have uh, got uh, gotten a hold of it in a more convenient position but it's pretty obvious that I can't put it on there the arm does not have enough reach but there are other strategies to attempt to try and get it on there we could reattach closer to the little docking port and then maybe the arm can stretch that much but it's it's tough even looking at it right now you could tell it doesn't look like the arm has got that kind of reach. Well, we did have a bit of an issue. And I think that's because I attempted time warping to stabilize stuff. And so we lost it and we had to revert. Like I said, I'll, I'll try and tell you every time we do that. Okay, uh, well, here I am actually using the RCS of the shuttle to move it and the station in a way and use inertia to allow the truss to float forward so that I could grab it from one end. And so now we have it there, and we're really gonna try and reach for the Z1 truss. But you can tell right here that it's gonna be tough. 
we're, we're as straight as we can be with the cannon arm right now. And if you take a close look at it, the thickness of the common birthing mechanisms certainly is making it hard. If we had tucked those in a little bit more, it would be a lot easier. So, I try and turn the shuttle, but taking a look at our fuel situation, it was abundantly clear to me that even if we redocked and got it together, we wouldn't be able to come back home. So, rather than do that, I decided to just come back home and try again. Now, I could have just reverted the flight right away, and probably should have, but instead, I decided to just try and land. After all, I needed some landed pr landing practice, you know, and wanted to see if the script could handle... Basically, we have no fuel left. That's, that's an interesting sort of situation for me, that we have no fuel left, and right now it's just holding the orientation with sheer will. Uh, well, actually, it's because it hit the atmosphere in that position, and it's a lot easier when it starts out like that. But we still have the truss in the bay, and you can see it's leaning, and, you know, you might think, okay, well, it's trying to use its cross range to hit Cape Canaveral, and this is an altitude where it should be able to do that, it's allowed to do that, but that's not, that is not what is happening. What is actually happening is that the truss is inside the bay wiggling around and you can see it actually poke out from the bottom there. And yeah, th th I think this has to do with the weird hitbox on the ISS community parts. Somebody had asked me how I got the ISS community parts working in this version. And the short answer is, I haven't really. <laughs> um, I I've tried my best to make them compile and show up. The first problem you'll have is that they don't show up. I think that... That has to do with the naming of the part. I fixed the name of them, and then they started showing up properly. But that's not the only thing that needs to be fixed with these. And this part should have been shielded by the cargo bay, but wasn't. You can see it's got all sorts of glitchy little things going on with it. Stretch, you see those, well I think those are the struts actually that uh, shoot out from it. The struts that were supposed to hold it in the bay safely, by the way. And we're doing so on the way up. Anyway, I, I won't, I won't belabor the point there. It, it was a tragic end. It did not work out for us, and we had to relaunch anyway. So, endeavor again on STS-97. And this time on the launch, I was able to adjust based on what happened in the previous launch to try and make sure I got the launch window right and get us closer to the station's inclination. And so we're in a better position here and we should have plenty of fuel this time. Again, this is basically the maximum that the shuttle carried to the station, so it's... If we can get this right, uh, we can be comfortable with uh, subsequent missions, especially the ones that have lighter loads. Fortunately, the launch program itself works great. I mean, and it's tested with all sorts of payloads. And in fact, I did test bringing payloads back down uh, with the re-entry script. Uh, just that they were generic payloads. They weren't uh, payloads like the truss, the P6 truss. They weren't ancient parts that have weird hitboxes. They were just procedural tanks to simulate loads. And those worked. Uh, we, I was able to bring those back down using the re-entry script without any wiggling or anything weird happening. So it really is that part rather than uh, the whole having something in the cargo bay come back down with the shuttle thing. Um, that said, I don't think I ever tested 15 tons with the shuttle coming back down. I think it's more like 12 tons. I don't think the shuttle was supposed to carry 15 tons back down. Ironically, actually, the payload in the back probably helped the balance. I felt like it did. So if we have to put ballast anywhere, it is probably in the back. That makes sense, because uh, putting ballast forward would make the craft nose down, and putting in the back would help it uh, stay at a higher pitch. And I think that that uh, load in the back did help maintain the orientation. Of course, it didn't really help with anything else, you know, with the way it was wiggling in the bay. Anyway. Here we are, trying once again to attach it, but now Canadarm has an extra, extra limb. Well, 
It's extended. It was extended as far as I could fit into the bay. So this is the longest cannon arm that can fit in the shuttle's bay. And with the shuttle docked in the right place, it's just about right to get this on that docking port on the Z1 truss. So not, I guess not an official cannon arm. I don't think it was ever this long, but I might keep this one. I think this one is good. I still would rather have another segment that could roll somewhere earlier than the end effector. That would be really handy, but I tried adding one and it didn't work. It didn't have the attachment nodes. Okay, now the, that was really annoying. Uh, now, I, I had it rotated a little bit incorrectly, admittedly, and that's because I couldn't figure out how to get it on quite right. But when, right when I released it so that I could attach to the Z1 truss, it rotated even more. I think I was probably like 20 degrees off. And it ended up like 45 degrees off. So, uh, while well, this is what it looks like now, I regret not putting a little Infernal Robotics rotational part, you know, like a washer or whatever those parts are that allow you to rotate, or, um, yeah, rototrons, I think they're rot rototrons. That could have helped. I think, I mean, then I could have reoriented this pretty easily. But, me and the Twitch chat agreed that this was going to have to be good enough and we needed to bring the shuttle back down. Now you can see there we have plenty of Delta V despite it being a, such a heavy load. We now have 500, way more than the 400 than I, that I require. So this is going to be sort of an ideal setup as long as I could figure out how to get back home on time. You know, and that, that's a longitude thing. Basically, I have to get into a standby orbit to make sure that our orbit ends up hitting Cape Canaveral because we're, we're not, at the station, we're not at an orbit that is, like, even. It's not an uh, hour and a half where if it's an hour and a half, you can figure that you're going to hit Cape Canaveral again after 16 orbits. Um, it's actually a little bit higher than that to where the International Space Station is. So that's a little bit inconvenient and you have to sort of recalibrate and figure out, okay, how many minutes am I off? from being exactly where Cape Canaveral will be under me when I get back. Anyway, uh, here I had forgotten that I had tuned down the RCS. I had actually thrust limited the RCS and that's why the engines in the back are overheating there. Uh, that's because I hadn't uh, unthrust limited them. And that was to save fuel, of course. Alright, but I did fix that. And the landmass that we were over before was Central America. Here we are approaching Florida. And you can see Tampa Bay up front there. There's a better view of Tampa Bay. And we're a little bit short. Uh, we're, we're okay. The lift of the vehicle should be able to handle it. But basically, I would have liked it a little bit further along than we are right now. So not perfect, but manageable. Something I can land. And so I'm still letting the, the re-entry script handle it. And I let it handle it uh, all the way up to around here. But here I start activating the fly-by-wire and aborting the program. So up to 27 kilometers. Ideally, I should let it control it until about 5 kilometers. It's, it's told to control it until 5 kilometers. At 5 kilometers, it definitely hands control over to me anyway. It doesn't attempt to land on its own. But I wanted to take control mainly to deal with the fact that I thought that we were too far north and I wanted to turn further south. Actually, it turned out that I was not as far north as I thought I was. So actually, probably a script could have continued handling it on its own. But anyway, we are on track here. And with the sunrise ahead, we were able to line up with the runway very nicely. That said, after the first attempt at STS-97, I was quite tired. I think I'd been streaming for six hours by the time this landing occurred. So it's not going to be the smoothest landing ever, and no, I still haven't fixed the drag chutes. So there are two overpowered drag chutes. We really need to tune those down. The reason I couldn't really put it put a single drag chute on the tail was because the vertical stabilizer doesn't have a wonderful hitbox right at that location. 
where the drag chute should come out of. So, but anyway, also obviously its brakes are a little bit messed up because only one side seems to extend. Alright, here we go. At least the brakes work. The air brakes on the vertical stabilizer, the split rudder. Okay, uh, touchdown a little bit late there. I guess in this case, having overpowered drag shoots really helps, so it always pulls me onto my tail. You know, a huge nose up wheelie thing. There was a shuttle mission where they did a wheelie, so I guess that's somewhat legitimate. But anyway, that's my International Space Station construction progress so far. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.